Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. We're going to begin shortly. We're just going to give everyone a couple minutes to get onto the webinar. Um, there are a couple of features we'll be reviewing in just a few minutes. Thanks for your patience. All right, once again, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar called Silence Versus Future Th Threats. We have Chad Skipper and Simon Edwards on today's call. Uh, before we get started, we wanted to go over some housekeeping items. Widgets at the bottom of your screen. Um, that is for the Q&A, which will allow you to submit questions. You can use the Q&A widget at any time during the webinar. We will be answering questions at the end of the webinar, but do feel free to use that throughout. Uh, your feedback is essential, so we will have a survey at the very end of the webinar. Please be sure to fill out those poll questions. And just as a reminder, the links for today's webinar and presentation will be sent to you via email within the next few days. It will also include resources um, and some of the papers that we'll be discussing. If you need help at any time during the webinar, uh, if you have any technical issues or any questions in general, please feel free to contact us at webinars at silence.com. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to have Chad take over at this point. So welcome, Chad. Thank you very much, Jamal. And thanks for everyone here attending today to um, take some time out of your day uh, to attend today's webinar. Um, to learn about, you know, how silence, um, AI and ML combats future stuff. So today, I, I'm Chad Skipper. I am Vice President of Competitive Intelligence and Product Testing at Silence. And with me today is Simon Edwards. He is the uh, SC, uh, CEO of SE Labs and founder and chairman of AMTSO. Hey, Simon. And Hi, Chad. Thank, thank you very you. much for having me. You're welcome. Okay, so let's let's move forward. Uh, Shamal, I cannot. Move. Here we go. Little technical difficulties. I now have control. Sorry about that. So, Simon, um, thanks for being here again. Let's start all over again. Um, can you possibly, as we begin to uh, move forward here, um, Let's talk about, uh, could you please provide us uh, a little bit of uh, the audience, some background on you and SE Labs? Sure, well, SE Labs is a London-based test lab, a security testing lab, and we also do consultancy. Um, I've been uh, doing security testing specifically with anti-malware products for probably about 20 years. Um, and I think my team and I were the first to do what is largely considered to be the first kind of real world test. And I think that's a really important point. I think tests have to be realistic to be useful. Um, and that meant that when uh, new types of security products come along, because we're doing real attacks in a realistic way, we're able to, to test them in a useful way uh, and not use old methodologies that are only useful for the traditional anti-malware, anti-virus. Um, so we work with companies like yours, we work with um, all of the other main anti-malware companies. And we also work with very large commercial organizations like banks and mineral resources, uh, the kind of companies that spend millions of dollars on security. Um, and so they really need to make sure that they're making good purchasing decisions and not just buying things based on marketing. That's great, Simon. So I wanna dive a little bit deep here for the audience. You know that here at Silence, we advocate uh, you know, real world testing methodologies and you definitely state uh, real world testing methodologies. Can you give us an example of what you mean by uh, real world t testing method that you use inside of SC Labs? Sure, I think um, if, you, if you take the most honest open approach and do a full attack from its very beginning all the way to its logical conclusion, which might be to damage a system or steal some information. Um, that's an attack that you can test in a, a security appliance with, an endpoint product, 
anything like that. When testing starts to become too synthetic um, and they maybe automate too much or are only evaluating one level of protection that you get with a certain product, that's when testing methodologies become a little bit suspect and they start to fall down when people take different approaches. But if I do a real attack against a, um, a system that's protected, I don't really care about how the protection is happening. If you want to block URLs or block scripts or, or block exploits, that's up to you as the vendor of the security product. As a tester, I just have to do an attack in a, a legitimately useful and realistic way. And that gives you all the options in the world to try and protect against my, my uh, attempts to compromise the system. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate that. And that's one of the, the major reasons why uh, we involved you and, and went to you about this uh, certain test that we're talking about. So, Simon, let's talk about future threats a bit and how it's possible to uh, predict and, and pre prevent them, right? So let's, let's discuss the predictive malware response test you conducted on silence and our results. So first off, let me ask you this. How good are you at predicting anything? Well, I mean, when, when it comes to human behavior, people are people. They've got certain needs, um, which you can probably predict. They were going to want to eat food and have shelter and this kind of thing. And, and having money is often a, a big drive. Um, but they're also adaptable as well, which makes them quite unpredictable in many ways. And they can be surprising. So, you know, you, just when you think you've got a handle on what you think someone's going to do, they might surprise you by being dishonest, or they might even surprise you by being more ethical than you would have assumed. Uh, people are very complex. Right. So how well, um, looking at this slide here, let's talk about how well we think the industry did in pre predicting and preventing campaigns like, let's look at this, WannaCry. Who would have predicted that a worm, you know, which we haven't seen the likes of in nearly a decade, would have taken out hospital systems, two airlines, railway systems, two automobile manufacturers, shipping companies, power companies. It went to police departments, ATMs, laundromat machines all around the world. Uh, you know, we, we've seen metrics of 230,000 machines uh, infected in one weekend, a $4 billion total impact. And um, most of the industry was, was reactive in nature. Um, take a look at Bad Rabbit. Bad Rabbit affected 200 major organizations, mainly in Russia. Ukraine and Germany, um, also Japan, and, and then in Turkey in just a few hours. Um, the bad rabbit ransomware has infected, you know, several Russian media outlets um, and Interfax news agencies um, uh, were confirmed to hit by this malware. And then from a predictive standpoint, um, we, we've seen small targeted hospitals, unknown ransomware, $75,000 paid. Uh, we talk about NotPetya. Um, some of the big companies hit by NotPetya malware in late June um, have, have reported losing hundreds of millions of dollars due to the cyber attack. We see 65 countries here, including one belonging to major organizations such as uh, Merck and FedEx and those types that you know, are being targeted here. Um, and then, uh, we have the NSA, NSA data breach, right? This was prior to WannaCry, but this brought things like Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar became widely spread. And then finally, Petya, you know, uh, look, it was a major global cyber attack outbreak that began essentially um, overseas Ukraine, but utilizing a new variant of Petya. Um, and, and so we see these things and, and, and from this, how would we be predictive around these things? And that is the challenge, and that's what we wanted you to test, is based upon some of this major malware, could silence be predictive in nature? So moving, moving forward, um, let, let's talk a little bit about um, the reactive limitations of, of security products. Because of this, it's caused millions in damage, right? Loss in productivity. Um, and disrupted power, police, ATMs, transport, hospitals, we can go on. But the point here that I, that, that I want to make from a silence AI and ML perspective is that we can do better than this. And we believe through this test that Simon, that you've done, is that we've proven that technology is, not, is no longer just reactive to the sacrificial lamb, right? 
Um, and we no longer have to do tons of sample creations, post-release, triage, classify and create these things, and basically live the Groundhog Day over and over and over again, right? So as we move forward here, Simon, how, how have you seen in your testing um, a, a, a uh, I guess, a change in the industry from what you've seen as reactive to now trying to be more predictive in nature? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, one of the big challenges is the, the sheer volume of different types of attacks. So what some people do is they try and um, detect that the thing is, they, they're not detecting the exact um, threat as such, they're kind of detecting the reputation of where it's coming from. So it might be the, um, the URLs, the websites that it's being launched from, or it could be um, where the emails are being sent from, that kind of thing. But we also know that while that can really help, it's certainly not um, 100%. Yeah, and we know nothing's 100%, but we do have to get to where we understand, and this is exactly where you were going from, is the reality check here is that we as humans aren't good enough to turn all of this analysis into predictions from a human standpoint around that future malware with enough confidence to create future signatures, reactive type capabilities to protect us. And in fact, it's, it's our, we as humans are simply inadequate to process all of this data to properly prevent um, future attacks. Look at all the indicators of compromise that we have, right? That we I think, I think just ahead. interrupt you for a second. I think yeah. that we can predict that some things will happen, like we should have predicted that the hospitals would be attacked. Um, you know, Die Hard 4, which came out years ago, actually each one of those ridiculous scenarios was based on something that happened in reality. So we can predict that people will do bad things and steal money and cause disruption, but it's, it's exactly technically how they're doing it, which is hard to, um, to predict, which is what, where you're going, I think, with the indicators of compromise. Correct, so we, can, we, we, we have the history Right, we have history of indicators of compromise. We have history of all the malware that was out there, right? Um, but you know, how do we take that history and able to uh, look at all that data and predict when we see something new in the environment, um, be able to predict its malicious intent? And so, with that, that's where um, we we want machines to be able to do what machines do, and they can do really well at taking large amounts of data and based upon that history, predict someone's malicious intent. And I think that's what we saw with your testing. So as we move forward here, um, let's, you know, the predictive advantage, the challenge has been, simply put, that the threat actors have had a predictive advantage over us. We've been playing catch up for years. Um, it's been mainly a reactive um, technology sets that, I have to see the attack in most cases before I can protect everyone. So there is most likely going to be that sacrificial lamb. But that was the case until now, we believe, at silence. So I want you to help us understand, and as we introduce the silence predictive advantage, help us understand how you defined predictive advantage and how we defined it together with your testing. Sure. Well, for us, predictive advantage is the difference in time between a technology, so it could be like your, your AI engine or, or whatever, some kind of technology being um, existing, being created, and then the time difference between that and a threat appearing and, and being noticed. And if you, if you are able to detect that new threat with the old brain, if you like, the old technology, that time difference is the predictive advantage. So, for example, if on Monday... I create a technology that I think will detect threats and a new threat is discovered on Friday and my product detects that as a threat and it hasn't been updated since. That's a predictive advantage of five days. That's how we define it. Good, thank you very much. So how we define it, that, that's exactly how we would define it. It's simply the AI's ability at, at, at its generic form to detect tomorrow's malware today. Right? It's a measurement of how far advanced that AI is able to predict and prevent, now prevention is key, uh, it from executing um, using some type of local model that doesn't require you know, the overhead associated with cloud lookups, signatures, continual updates, those types of things. So 
the, the, the silence predictive advantage is that users of silence and protect have against those future uh, threats. So given that definition, let's now uh, turn our attention to uh, and take a moment to see how predictive advantage works in our world today outside of the security atmosphere. So Netflix. So everyone here on the phone probably has, has heard of Netflix. Um, and you most likely are utilizing Netflix. So Netflix watch list algorithm makes suggestions based off previously watched videos, content, and search data. Uh, data. It, it's really tailored for your full experience uh, to the user um, from the art used to advertise to the trailer shown. So as an example, Netflix predictive AI it, um, it's so effective that you now don't even have to use a five-star rating system anymore for it to know what you'll want to watch for years to come. It's all based on that predictive self-learning AI that knows your movie and TV tastes in a ways you'll never really even comprehend yourself. Then there's Siri. Siri and Google Assistant, they use AI to understand and predict search results relevant to you. They recommend content to read based off of your past usage. And then lastly, we've got Amazon. Amazon uses predictive advantage to personalize your shopping experience. I can tell you that I've enjoyed that personalized shopping experience, but it has hit my checkbook on many occasions because you get click happy with all the neat gadgets that are on, on, <laughs> uh, on, on Amazon. Have you experienced that in your, in, in your world, uh, uh, Simon, on where you see that predictive advantage? Definitely, yeah. And, and when you buy something and it says, oh, people have bought that also have wanted to buy this as well. You think, oh, yeah, I could actually quite do with that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, right, right. And then I can tell you this story from a, uh, every year my family and I watch a certain movie at Christmas, right? And, and, and it's a funny movie. It's, it's one of those great uh, Christmas movies. And last year on December 2nd, that movie popped up on Netflix as uh, do you want to watch this again? Because it knew that I was watching that a year prior. So it was predicting, hey, you know, Chad might, and his family might like to watch this particular movie. And it reminds me, oh, yeah, we need to watch that movie for this year. Um, all right. So I want to show also how we also have an example of, of predictive advantage in a real world where the AI was able to predict someone's malicious intent. And then that is the power behind the artificial intelligence and machine learning from silence is our ability to predict the malicious intent of something new that was introduced in the environment. So alpha is this predictive AI. During a, a, a simulated aerial combat with Colonel Lee, he could not score a single kill shot. Um, and all of this was done against the alpha processor um, uh, was on a computer that was runs, it was a $500 PC, but it was able to uh, uh, look at those combat moves and over 250 times faster than the blinking eye it, it, relative to reaction times. And what was interesting, the comment from Colonel Lee was, you know, it seemed to be aware of my intentions and reacting instantly uh, to change my, to, to change much of my changes in flight and his missile deployment. All right, so it knew how to defeat the shot he was taking before he was going to take that shot. So that's the power that we've even seen in other AI technologies is able to predict someone's malicious intent. So Simon, let me ask you this question. Um, now, that we, um, can, now that we can provide an overview of, of this, how is it that you came about to testing uh, the predictive advantage. How did you, can you provide that overview for us? Sure. Well, what we were really interested in were threats that people have heard about, ones that have um, hit the headlines, things that have cost people lots of money. Because I think while, um, you know, people do, do predict bad stuff will happen, it always happens to other people. Um, so those hospitals we were talking about probably didn't think that it would happen to them, and it did. So we thought, let's go for some headline-hitting threats that everybody's heard about, then no one can say, oh, this is some obscure uh, threat that only affected a small number of people. These are all really important threats. And of course, um, when you are a, a bad guy, you don't just try it once and 
um, get some money and then move on. Uh, th these, these threats are organized in campaigns, so they slowly evolve over time. And, and as you said, um, the security companies are reacting. So the threat I produce on the Monday may well be detected on the Friday. So I have to keep developing it and trying to evade detection. So what we did was um, get samples of very well-known threats, such as the bad rabbit one you mentioned earlier, the WannaCry, um, and the exploits that go with that, uh, such as Eternal Blue. And we attacked the systems using these threats. And each, each WannaCry threat, uh, we, we didn't just use one, we used a range of them, um, spanning the time that the WannaCry campaign was run. Um, and we pushed all those threats towards the system that was running um, a silence brain, if you like, an artificial intelligence trained model um, that had been made nearly up to three years um, before the threats had come about. So yeah, on the on the table that you just flicked to there, let's let's look at that. Um, we actually well, used let me, the, let, me, let me pause and just make sure yeah, uh, I clarify something for everyone here. Look, what's what Simon and his organization did was essentially, and it was on this last slide. I want to make this point: is it, it's equivalent of taking our product that was built um, two years ago. 18 months ago, right? And putting it in an environment in an out of date mode and seeing how well it works with future threats. That was the, how well is the AI when it comes to introdu being introduced with new threats that it's never seen before? Because that's the goal. The goal is to prevent and predict threats that are always coming out that we just don't have time to see uh, before we are able to prevent them. So yes, moving forward, the purpose of the test, Simon, Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Thanks for that clarification. Yes. Yeah, so we we've got a silence kind of technology that was created back in May 2015, and we're not allowing it to update itself. It's not looking to the cloud for any any further information. What we're looking at is can this brain in isolation detect threats that had not existed when it was made. So we were talking earlier about that. So then we scroll forward um, and we're looking at threats from. Um, uh, early 2016 all the way up to the end of 2017 so at, at the most extreme uh, you could have a threat that was nearly three years older um, than the product's own knowledge and what the results showed was that it was capable of detecting things that hadn't existed for many many months um, so, since, since it's been made. Sorry. So we, before we get into into the results, let's take a look. And I want to understand, you know, the malware sample validation that you did inside of your organization. Look, I came to you and I said, "This is what we want to test." Um, did I provide? Did we provide the malware to you? No, no, you can't. You can't do that. Um, all, all good tests um, of of security products should get. Um, the threats it will either create them develop them or find them um, without taking any kind of feeds from the vendor itself or actually to be honest from any vendor because um, some of the people listening may may know may not know that actually there's a kind of a threat intelligence sharing um, going on behind the scenes so even if I took a threat from some other vendor I don't know whether or not they've shared that with with silence so I can't trust any vendor in the world to provide me with threats to use in a test even if they're not in the test. So we have to find all of the threats in this case um, independently, uh, which meant that you know, we're, we're scanning all sorts of places. We, we also um, happen to deal with certain breaches ourselves we, in our consultancy um, side of things. So we have a pretty good access to threats that are not in general circulation. And we certainly don't go to VirusTotal or, or any of those other um, sources to download threats because they're too well known and too shared amongst the vendors. So once you get the threat, so um, the malware families uh, that you tested are here, right? You, mm -hmm. you went and found on your own research, Bad Rabbit, um, all the way through Locky, Not Petcha, Petcha, WannaCry, these types of things. So once you get them, what is your validation process to make sure that yes, this is actually malware and yes, this is, this is a, a true um, from, from a source that, that you trust? Sure. And this, this goes back right to the beginning of, of the conversation we're having where doing things realistically really matters. You know, we could do some clever stuff, some shortcuts, whatever, but ultimately we've got a load of physical PCs in the lab running different versions of Windows and we will manually um, 
assault those systems with these threats and we will see um, the ransomware kicking in we'll see the files being encrypted you know the, the, with ransomware there really is no ambiguity it's it's either malicious or it's not and i guess some might sit there quietly for a while but we absolutely validated that each one of these threats did very very bad things to the target systems all right so next i just want to show everyone just a the predictive advantage and the graphical representation here <laughs> of what, um, what this means. So if you look utilizing silence um, and how it's protecting you from future, future threats. So the test took three of our past AI models and our current AI model, put it in an offline environment. So this is where you see these four over here in the back uh, on the left. So these were installed on a, on a PC, never connected to the internet so that it could not get updates. Um, and it, as is, um, it looks as if it was that the AI never connected on a system offline um, as of May 2015, October 2015, June 2016, and April 2017. And then you went and researched and got current um, malware that had been infected over the past uh, few years and deployed those in an offline environment against all of these models. And so that was performed underneath your strict controls to ensure the integrity of these results. Um, you'd like to add anything else to that? Well, yeah, actually, we don't always trust um, the product. So if a product in any of our testing says, okay, we recognize that threat, we detect it and we stop it, uh, we don't believe that uh, by default. We will do further forensics to establish whether or not the threat actually did anything bad um, because it may encrypt a few files, or it may sit there and wait until we're not looking and then start doing bad things. So we don't rely on the product's own reports. We validate manually um, whether or not the threat has done a bad thing or not or is capable of doing a bad thing. Great. And Based upon that, let's get to the results. So remember, predictive advantage, the ability to um, detect future threats. This was really not an efficacy test, though, is it? You're not going to see a percentage of 99%, 98%, 97%. We're going to see what, Simon? What are we going to see here? We're interested in the time difference. How, how good is the product at working against threats in the near, middle, and distant future? And to okay. what extent? So the results that we found is here, scoring predictive advantage. Can you explain this slide to us, please, Simon? All right, well, let's, let's take Cerber, the, the second one from the left as an example, uh, because that has the largest, I think, predictive advantage, uh, because I've got part of the graph covered. Yep, no, that's correct. Um, so that means that those samples um, were really recent. Um, the, the time difference between them existing and being known to exist and the time that the artificial intelligence um, agent was trained was 30 months, so two and a half years, call it. Uh, that's what that tells us. So it means that the, the server guys, um, for, to, for two and a half years, anything that they would have created would have been detected um, by this particular artificial intelligence agent. Um, with Lockheed, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was, it was worse at detecting Lockheed there, because you can see Lockheed has a predictive advantage of somewhere between 15 to 20. It just means that Lockheed occurred earlier um, than server. Right, so we have here silence on average, right? Had a 25 month predictive advantage over the tested malware. So meaning um, what this means is our AI models that were built 25 months ago, right? Was detecting new malware that was released today as an example. Mm -hmm. So on average, let's, let's dive a little bit deeper here um, and, and speak to um, the results in detail. Why did you go and pick um, uh, multiple variants of, of the malware? And now when we'll talk about variants. These variants, were they modified in any way or were these uh, you know, packed or anything else like that? We didn't do any modification ourselves. We tried to keep things um, as realistic as possible because otherwise people say tests can get manipulated and all that kind of thing. So we know that, um, for example, in, in the one you've got on the screen, that the GoldenEye um, samples ranged um, from quite some period, you know, from the end of 2016 through to the middle of 2017. And as I said earlier, that's because the attacking guys, they're not just creating one threat um, and, and running with it. Um, you guys and other security vendors are detecting them, blocking them, and so they have to keep um, changing. They have to keep morphing to, to keep succeeding and getting past 
the different products. And every time a new version comes out, people will detect it and then they have to make further changes. So this is a campaign. We can talk about a family. A family just means um, very, very similar threats made by the same personal people. Um, they look similar to machines. But really, we should talk about campaigns where at the beginning of the campaign, they start having some success. They start being defeated. They start changing up their game. Then they start being defeated again. And then they make further and further changes. And that way, we're able to get a whole group of similar threats with different timestamps on them and say, OK, well, um, in this case, Silas detected the oldest one. But actually, even as they developed and tried to evade detection over a period of, of uh, half a year, um, the AI engine was still able to detect it. So they were predicting not just that first piece of malware, not that someone could write a GoldenEye, but the changes that the GoldenEye authors would make as well. Absolutely. So let's, let's look at this. Um, get into uh, more detail here. This is, this is Silent's predictive advantage. This is our ability to stay ahead of the threat, our ability to detect unknown malware um, within milliseconds of its introduction into uh, onto the endpoint where Silence Protect is, is, is residing. So this is also about updates, right? This is uh, as the AI model was built in 2015, we were able to prevent and detect um, all of this malware. So we, we also tested um, against all of our models to include our current model. But on average, you know, we're seeing anywhere from bad rabbit. Look at bad rabbit. Um, the, the earliest model was detecting on this and bad rabbit was introduced 20 months, 29 months after our AI model was built. So that's how you read this. Can you give us some more insight into some of these summits? Yeah, I would, I would just try and, and emphasize that the numbers don't have anything to do with, um, you know, how effective it was at detecting it. All of these threats were detected. Okay, this is just the time difference between the age of the AI and the threats. So if we go back to GoldenEye again, we can see that GoldenEye 4 um, has a very different predictive advantage time to GoldenEye 2. And that's not because the product has done anything wrong. It's simply that uh, GoldenEye 4 um, was an older version than GoldenEye 2. Both were detected, but the time difference was 19 months for GoldenEye 4 and then 26 months, so you know, just, just over two years for GoldenEye 2 and 3. Great. Um, moving forward then, let's then start talking about the values here of, of predictive advantage and based upon these results. If, if you had Silence Protect, um, it's safe to say that, that, that silence prevented these threats without ever seeing them prior to the inter, inter, introduction on the endpoint. Um, the value of predictive advantage that comes with AI is that when something new is introduced onto the endpoint, the AI has that predictive power to convict that malicious intent prior to execution without ever having seen that malicious application previously, right? No more sacrificial lambs, no more living the same reactive day over and over and over again. We, you know, the AI um, based uh, on endpoint products um, can protect your, infra your endpoint infrastructure from those th future threats. Um, it has a unique ability here to, again, stop tomorrow's threats today, um, no updates, no needing for uh, cloud resiliency, um, and you can eliminate you know, unforeseen management and employee costs associated with that critical incident response around things like WannaCry and not Petya and Petya. So Simon, as we close this out, I'd like to understand, you give, give your audience what your conclusion was and your take on these results. Well, I have to admit that before we started this test, I was pretty cynical. And I think we can all admit that some of the, the marketing around some of the newer security products has been very aggressive and, and, and I think not very convincing. So I really didn't know what to expect when we did this test. Um, and I was genuinely surprised that it managed to detect everything, essentially. Yeah, and I like your final quote here. Um, you know, to, to, to see that the technology, like you said, had, has heavily been marketed over the years. Um, it, was, it was reassuring and, and exciting to you to see our ability to prevent and, and prevent and predict these future threats. Yeah, because we, we want people to be safe, don't we? The whole yeah. purpose behind SE Labs 
is to try and make things better. And the way we're making things better is to do testing, which A, helps people make a good pur purchasing decision, but also when we work with you and, and, and other guys, we explain where the problems are and that helps improve the product so everybody benefits. So when something comes along that does appear to be getting that step ahead of the bad guys, that's what we should all want, regardless of which companies we work for. Correct. Absolutely. We, we, we want to be able to um, stay ahead of the threat. Exactly. Um, and, and, and not be so reactive. And we believe that silence is positioned very well here with our artificial intelligence and machine learning. Hey, Simon, I, I appreciate and we appreciate you taking the time today. We appreciate you um, allowing us to work with you inside of your advanced lab infrastructure and, and the tests that you performed relative to uh, the predictive advantage of our <coughs> artificial intelligence. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks, Jeff. All right, so now we will open it up to questions <coughs> and answers. Uh, Shamala, can we go to uh, the poll and see if there are any questions and answers that we, or questions that we can answer? I can see a question, do you want me to answer it? Um, I'm trying to get there to the question. Shamal, can I get access to the Q&A panel? Simon, if you see a question there, go ahead. Yeah, okay. The, the question from Ken is, do any other vendors have a similar technology or is Silence unique in this respect? What was really important to us was to create a good, um, valid testing methodology that would work with any other uh, similar technology. And so, yes, I think... You know, if, if a product is not completely tied to the cloud, if it can have its machine learning um, operate in an offline mode, absolutely it could, could be tested in this way. And I think, I think it should be as well. I would, I would say that, uh, you know, from that perspective, that's one of the reasons why we did this test is in order to, in order to see if us and other vendors out there have this predictive capability, um, you know, the challenge here is from a testing organism, a testing perspective, there's a lot of folks out there that, you know, how do you introduce something new into the environment, right, Simon? And, and that, beca that can become very difficult. So in order to test the AI itself, you have to change the state of the environment, right? Um, and uh, from that, if you change the state of the environment, meaning put it in an out of date state and introduce something new to it, that's a way to test AI and ML, right? Yeah, because, but you, you have to be careful because the minute you make artificial situations like um, putting things in offline situations and introducing certain types of threats, then people say, oh, this is, this is a marketing based test. This, this isn't, um, isn't real world. And we, we very much specialize on real world. But in this specific case, testing this kind of technology, you can assess whether or not it could have predicted um, future threats, but you do have to go into offline mode to do that. Correct, and, 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 and that's the vow that, you are correct, it's a new way of testing, it's an adapted way of testing, testing because AI has been introduced into the market, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in order to really understand, I can't express enough that for AI to really truly test AI, it has to be introduced with something it has never, ever, ever seen before and be able to predict, right, or be able to score whatever words you want to use, but be able to understand if it has a malicious intent and if it does to be able to stop that. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Okay. All right. No other questions. No other questions. Okay, Simon, I appreciate your time today. Folks on the phone, I appreciate your time as well. Um, and I uh, hope everyone has a good rest of their day. Thank you Brilliant. very much. Thanks, everybody. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.